This video is going to be about Control Surface Studio, a software that lets you create your own custom MIDI scripts inside Ableton Live. And for me it has been a total game changer because its possibilities go way beyond what you can achieve by the conventional MIDI mapping inside Ableton Live. It can heavily increase the functionality of your controllers and basically serves as a bridge between the musician and the programmer. And in this video I want to share with you how it works and what I particularly like about it. For disclosure, this video is sponsored by Control Surface Studio, which makes me super happy. I reached out to John, who's the creator of Remotify, which is the brand behind Control Surface Studio, because I just love this software so much and find it so valuable for musicians. So I'm super thankful that they're actually sponsoring this. Thanks a lot. My name is Janis, and first let's take a look at those typical limitations you run into when you're using the internal MIDI mapping system inside Ableton Live. One thing that always bothered me is that once you map something to a track, it's always fixed to that track. So if I open the MIDI mapping menu, and then let's say I want to change the volumes of those four channels. So I'm going to map those four things. And I mean, for now, everything's cool because I have channel four, channel three, channel two, channel one. But what if I change up the order? So maybe this channel, and sorry for just calling them one, two, three, four audio, but it's just for demonstration purposes. I want to move this track to the end. Now the mapping doesn't adapt because if I move the fader for um, track one, I actually change the volume of track four. And I mean, I could now remap it, but the thing is, if you're in some constant work in progress setting where you just change the order, change maybe the effects and change the settings, you have to constantly do this. And I find this incredibly frustrating. And you already get a way better functionality out of any controllers if you use like internal scripts, because almost any controller you buy comes with some sort of Ableton Live script. Also here, the launch key mini has it. So for example, I can press shift and volume and now I can control the volume of the first eight channels and it always uses the track position. So if I move this first track to the fourth position, I still control the volume of track one with this fader. So it's not, not stuck to the actual track, which is some improvement. At the same time though, you're stuck with this internal script because you can't really change anything about it unless you're, you know something about programming or code, which for me is not the case. And the launch key actually has some amazing functions that are impossible to program inside the internal Ableton Live MIDI mapping menu. So for example, you can also go to device, which now means that whatever track you select, so if I select track one, I actually have access to the parameters of the device control. And then if I select the second track, I can change the controls here. And that's something that I always missed because it's so great if you click on a track and then you can just change the parameters for that track without having your mapping fixed to all those individual tracks. And all of this is actually possible with Control Surface Studio. And in the end, you always create a script because under preferences in the MIDI menu, you see that here you have a control surface. And for my launch key mini, I had a preset because here you have a long list of presets for all conventional MIDI controllers. And what we do with Control Surface Studio is actually create a control surface that we can also load up here, but it's completely customized to what we need. Inside Control Surface Studio, there are like two main menus, the controller template and the script. And first you need a controller template, which is like some graphic representation of your controller because you need some knobs you can actually assign to functions, which is then happening inside the script. So first we need some controller template and we'll just add a new one just for demonstration purposes, call it test and uh, open it. You start with a blank canvas, which might look a little intimidating and might remind you a little of some math class, but uh, actually it's quite straightforward because here you have all types of functions that can be on a controller. So for me, it's like mostly knobs and you can just click on a knob and bring it in and then add another one and just place them next to each other. And if I want to further define this knob, I click on this edit icon. First I can give it a name, so I could call it like Fader Fox 1. And then you have to also assign a MIDI node and the most simple solution is to just enable the MIDI learn mode because once this is on, you can actually click on this field and just move the knob you want to assign. And then it actually listens to the MIDI input and this is for example like channel 1 value 66 and you're all set so on the controller you don't have to change anything. Actually let's also create one button so we have two types of examples so here's the button. 
This time I want to control it with my launchpad, so I might just call it launchpad1. And again, it listens to the MIDI input, so I press the button that I want to assign. It's like channel 1, value 10. For buttons, it's good to understand that sometimes you may want to send out note values. So if you click on type, you can also select note, which is the case for drum pads, for example. If you have some pads you want to play some beats with, you usually send out note values and you can change it here. And also it's important to understand that there's a momentary function and a toggle function. Momentary means that you just send out one short impulse. So for example, if you want to just select a track, which is what I want to do here, it's enough to have the momentary function. Or if you want to start a clip, stop a clip, or hit the record button. But if you want to have some on-off function, you need to switch to toggle. So if it's a plugin you want to turn on or off, or um, if it's actually a track you want to turn on and off, then you need the toggle function. Once you have all the controls you want to use, you just click on save and then you can actually leave this menu and start creating a script. So also here you go to add new, I'll also call it test. I'll add and open. And this is actually my personal script that I'll also show you in a second. But uh, there are lots of settings so it's a little easier to switch over to the test script with just our two knobs. And then it's quite straightforward because you just look for the function that you want to control inside Ableton Live and click add a mapping. And I mean here you see there's a long list with functions. And you basically select the function you want to use and then assign the knob. And I'm just going to show you two examples. So what I like to use is the highlight navigation. So let's say I call it select track one because I really like to have uh, control for selecting tracks and for arming tracks. Somehow there are few templates for conventional MIDI controllers that include all of this. So I just like to create this myself here. And then for the navigation it's like a select track. It's, tr uh, it's a track. It could also be a scene but here's the track. Select track number one and then for the controller input I just um, choose the launch pad one and then I'm all set. And I'm going to create one more because I want to show you this selected device control thing which I find incredibly useful. So again I add a mapping. This time I go to device parameter and I say actually selected device one. Then under track type you can select selected. So you could also say it's the first return track for example, the selected track or also the master. It's so amazing. It's not possible inside Ableton Live. And um, then the device selection. So it's like the first device could also be the second device. And um, the device parameter number is also one. Minimum zero, maximum hundred. That's cool. And then here I actually select the Fader Fox one and I also click save. And here are our two mappings now. And once you're done, all you have to do is click this icon here because then it sends the script to Ableton Live. And we can head over to Ableton now and actually try the script and see if it works. And first you need to go to the preferences menu because you have to assign the script to con the controllers. So you can see that for example here, the Fader Fox is connected to CSS Mobile Drama, which is actually the script I use for everything. Um, or Mobile Drummer Clean August 18. There have been some uh, revisions. But uh, in this case, it's the CSS test, which is going to be assigned to the Fader Fox and also to the Launchpad Mini. So here we also have to select the script. And then it should actually work. So if I select track two, I should be able to select track one by pressing this but bottom left knob of the Launchpad. And it works. And the first knob of the Fader Fox should actually be able to control the first parameter of the device control and it absolutely is. And now to see if it actually works uh, for the selected devices I'm going to create a second MIDI channel with just another type of instrument. And once I select this one I should automatically be able to control the parameter here and yes it works. And that's basically how you set it up and I mean you have to do it way more often and way more times for assigning like 16 knobs or 32 knobs. But that's just the basic principle and actually it's quite straightforward. I'm using the software in a slightly different way though and to some of you it might seem a little overly complicated but I still want to share it with you. Because as you can see I didn't try to graphically represent my controllers. I basically have a list of knobs and 
buttons like global control such as tempo, cue volume, undo or play. I did it this way because I have multiple controllers. That's why I decided I once want to make some new MIDI mapping system, which is also why I have some other list that I use for my own monitoring and also organization. But it's also a once set and forget kind of thing because now I never touch the script again or I don't have to touch it. It's basically fixed. And whenever I want to change something to my controllers, I just go to my list and look for the function and if I for example see something about I don't know device control channel 3 I want to add this to a controller where it's not existing yet I go to the controller menu and change the internal MIDI node for that particular knob to in this case channel 2 let's say 33. That's just my preferred way of working that I wanted to share with you, but still it can sound a bit complicated to you. But I'm using it all the time, especially when I'm playing live. So if you're interested, you can check some little performance videos. I'm going to link them down below in the description where everything you see is actually based on that script. And also I have a duo where we perform improvised electronic music. It's called TOSP and I also will put you some link down below in the description where also basically all my improvisation concept is based on this Ableton script. And for my live set, I mostly use my launchpad for the main navigation. So here you can see I can select those channels and then I can also arm them and unarm them, mute and also solo. And here I have some global control. So this is undo, for example, this is play. Here I can turn the click on and off. And I also have one device control that is uh, assigned to the selected track. So whatever track I select, I'm going to change the parameters. And I want to show you some cool example that also relates a lot to mixing or working in your home studio. Because um, here I have some rack with some EQ and I actually used some FabFilter EQ because I want to show you that this works really well with third-party software as well if you integrate it into audio effect racks. Because here I have it on all four channels and so I can now navigate here between those different channels. And for example I want to make some changes to the band one of this uh, EQ on track two. I can just do it here and then perfectly make changes. and. I like this way of working because it also helps you to uh, trust your ears basically. So you don't always see the graph, you can actually just focus on turning the knobs. And you're also not limited to mapping it per track because it's also kind of annoying if you always have to go to some other menu here and you get mixed up. You just select another track and then you just continue. And now on track 4 I can also make some adjustments to the EQ and it's just such a great way of working. and really increasing the workflow instead of slowing you down. So this selected device control is just one of those gazillion functions that you can find. But for me, it almost was already worth buying it. And that brings up another point I really like, which is that you can grow with the software. I feel like I'm only using a fraction of what's possible because I mean, I use some basic mappings. And as I said, I was super happy with just having the more refined track and selected device controls and stuff. But you can actually access the whole Ableton API system. I mean, maybe you don't even know what, what this is called, but here you have some function that is called reactions. And it basically means that your controller can react to some events that happen inside Ableton Live. So you don't just say like button X is doing this. You can also tell basically the script that it listens for events that happen. So if you add a listener here, you can see, oh, actually that was too much, On, only one is enough. Um, that you can say, for example, if you go to clip, if you change the color, something um, happens to the controller. So actually this could mean that if you have some graphic representation of your clips, that it reacts to it because you can impact the way that the colors shine on the controller and the kind of color signal that gets sent out from your computer to your controller. And I'm totally not into this yet, but I feel like, okay, I kind of have my things under control right now and whenever I feel ready, I can use this software to learn and to actually expand the possibilities of my controller. Because what I mentioned earlier, that they increase the value of your controllers is such a cool point because instead of inspiring you to buy new gear, it inspires you to learn because you have the stuff already. You can just get more out of it once you have the software and the controllers. And that's something I like so much because everybody wants you to buy something new all the time. But people don't speak so much about how you can actually get 
more out of what you have. And this software absolutely does it. And that's what I like so much. So over the years, I feel like I can grow with it. And maybe at some point, I'll be able to set up some cool reactions inside Ableton Live as well. So yeah, I'd say check it out yourself. I can highly recommend it. And also, I can highly recommend to drop by at the Remotify YouTube channel because there are super great in-depth tutorials. I think I've watched all of them. Because this video was more like a short explanation on stuff that I like about it. But there's way more to explore. Also, thanks again to John and Remotify for sponsoring this video. I'm super happy that we collaborated on this one. And apart from that, I just wish you lots of inspiration with whatever it is that you create and hope to see you soon again at this channel. Bye.